while G20 leaders in Seoul haggle over currencies and coordinated economic growth, a significant shift in power is taking place in the epicenter of the world economy, the Asia-Pacific. Welcome to Agenda, and joining me this week is Roger Baker. Roger, the move of economic power to the Asia-Pacific region has become a bit of a cliché, but what about strategic and military power? Well, certainly everyone has raised the concern that uh, China is an emerging power, not only in its economic strength, uh, but in political influence regionally and in becoming uh, more assertive, particularly in the past few years, uh, militarily. But China is not the only uh, growing uh, military power in the region. We've seen changes in the behavior of the Japanese. We see Vietnam starting to stand up. And more recently, we've seen Russia, which has l largely settled uh, its position in the, in the West, start to look east again and become more involved in the Asia Pacific. To what extent is Russia actually rebuilding its focus towards the Asia Pacific? For the Russians, the, the end of the Cold War uh, really drew most of Moscow's attention over to European Russia. And the, the country didn't do a whole lot in the Far East. It maintained certain contacts in Vietnam. It maintained some economic contacts into China, uh, arms sales into China and the like. But it didn't focus a lot of attention on Siberia, on, on its uh, Far East and on its Pacific front. Uh, in the past few years, we've seen the Russians move from a rhetorical shift to saying that they need to rebalance to uh, more action. We've seen them actually uh, make progress on pipelines. We've seen them ramp up uh, military production, uh, testing training, readjusting the, the military basing, uh, bringing more submarines into the region, and becoming what would be uh, certainly not on the, the level of the Chinese activity or the Japanese activity, but certainly a more active Russia than we've seen in many years. Are you able to quantify for me the growing muscle of Russia in East Asia? It, it may not really be quantifiable at the moment. It's still in its early stages. But some of the things that we look at are, of course, its energy. Uh, we look at the movement of uh, military equipment. We look at the uptick in, in test flights, in uh, training and activities in the Far East, and in the Russians starting to reach out for additional economic connections. Uh, we've seen the Russians, obviously, for years active in Vietnam. We've seen them become active or, or, or more active in places like Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. And, and so it's not yet at a point where we can say, well, the Russians have, uh, have an, an economic influence or, or a political influence matching those of, of the bigger powers in the region. But certainly we are seeing the steps uh, to, to bring the Russians back into the Pacific. Of course, China is the fastest growing big power in the region, and its recent assertiveness has worried many other countries. Certainly from the view of the uh, archipelagic nations of Asia, the, the expansion of China is, is disconcerting. The Chinese, if you look at them, are somewhat constrained geographically. Uh, they're held in very tight in the East China Sea. They're, they're surrounded by the Korea, by Japan there, uh, and the islands, southern Japanese islands running down to Taiwan. They're, they're constrained in the South China Sea, as you look at Southeast Asia, run through there all the way to the Strait of Malacca. And, and it's very difficult for the Chinese. They feel that they really need to push out of these constraints. But doing so, of course, comes into the territory of these other countries. And these other countries don't necessarily see this as a defensive action by the Chinese, but they perceive it as something that could threaten their own interests. And so we do have this rising sense of tension in the region. The United States is starting to be drawn back into East Asia, both out of its own volition uh, and out of concerns by its allies calling it in and by by even by Southeast Asia. So we've seen the United States re-engage with ASEAN. We see the United States working with Indonesia, with Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, countries that are going to allow the U.S. to step up its economic connections, step up its security and political connections. And now we've seen the Russians also step in. And where the United States coming in appears to be uh, in many ways seen as a way to counter China, and whether that's 100% accurate or not uh, uh, matters less than how the Chinese perceive it. Uh, but the Russians uh, are coming in in a much quieter manner. Uh, they're supporting the Chinese, and so they don't seem to be coming in to, to push back against the Chinese. Where the r biggest concern on the Russian front is, is the Japanese, 
And Japan is going to be the country really to watch as we see these shifting dynamics in Asia, particularly security dynamics, because Japan finds itself squeezed between a China that is pushing out and a Russia that is starting to become more active in the region again. And that leaves Japan pinched. Will Japan see Russia's move as good, bringing some kind of balance to the region, or will they fear it? Conceptually, a, a return of Russia to the region should help to balance things out. But the Russian actions thus far don't seem to be uh, leaning in that manner. The Russians sort of backed up the Chinese view on the Chonan incident in South Korea. The Russians backed up the Chinese view on the Chinese-Japanese spat over islands. And as the Russians are, are coming back, we see them becoming more active with military overflights, uh, even into, into uh, Japanese airspace. And from the Japanese perspective, the visit to the Northern Territories by Medvedev was, was a very aggressive move uh, from Tokyo's view, and a move that suggests to Tokyo that not only is Russia pushing back in the region, but Russia is not going to deal with Japan. And then add on that Russia is, is pushing out to the Kamchatka Peninsula for its submarine basing, and that puts them on the outside of Japan. And now Tokyo looks at Russia and, and is wondering about how does it balance its restructuring of defensive forces. So Tokyo had been looking to finally break away from the Cold War structure, where most of its defense posture was facing north towards Russia, and instead has been looking at moving forces to the south to be able to defend against, ultimately, China. Now it's got the Russians coming back on the northern border. Roger, there's so much more we could discuss here, but we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Roger Baker, ending this week's agenda. I'm Colin Chapman. Thanks very much for joining me. Bye for now.